Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Cool. Let's go. What a week it's been. Truly. I'm Alex. And I'm Emily. And welcome to What a Week. You want it, we got it. We're bringing you the top internet culture stories you need to be in the know. Let's dive right in. This week's episode is dedicated to one woman, Selena Quintanilla. For those who don't know, Selena is an icon and referred to as the queen of Tejano music. A large part of her icon status is because of her identity as a Latina. She embraced both parts of her heritage as an American and a Mexican. She represents millions of first or second generation Latinos who were born in the U.S., couldn't speak Spanish perfectly, but still had strong Latin roots. Her story from rags to riches was relatable and inspired Latins to keep working towards their dream. She is ranked as one of the most influential Latin artists of all time, and she's credited for cap catapulting the Tejano music genre and helping pave the way for women in that genre as well. Selena was at the peak of her career when she was killed on March 31st, 1995 by her friend and the former manager of her boutique just 16 days before her 24th birthday. Two weeks later, George W. Bush, who was Texas governor at the time, declared her birthday as Selena Day in Texas. Her album, Dreaming of You, came out July of that year and debuted number one, making her the first Latin artist to accomplish this. I mean, she's an absolute icon. And now her legacy is being showcased in a new Netflix show that just came out this week called Selena, the series. To talk more about Selena, her impact, and the Netflix show, we're joined by San Diego State Media Studies professor and our friend, Dr. Nate Rodriguez. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Nate. We're obviously so excited to have you because you're one of our favorite people ever. Well, you so are my favorite people ever. Like, I will hey. come on the show to talk about anything. Yes. <laughs> well, first things first, why don't you tell us about your Selena class that you teach at SDSU? Oh, Selena class. Yes, it's one of the, I think, most necessary classes that I have ever taught at San Diego State University. You know, I created this a couple of years ago. It took a long time to create it, but it's basically a class that uses Selena as kind of that core cultural pop culture bridge that students can then take what is happening in the media, right, and connect it to other issues of theory, Latinx representation, politics, culture, all of these cool things. And so Selena is really one of those enduring pop cultural icons that can really help people, I think, connect to much broader issues of misogyny, sexism, racism, xenophobia, and also issues of identity. A lot of the students that went through my class last semester really talked about how she represented being kind of like in the middle, this kind of liminal space of not being here, not even there. And she was kind of trying to straddle both cultures and both worlds of Mexican culture and American culture, Spanish language, English language, while also, you know, trying to be an American teenager that's, you know, working her butt off. Exactly. And okay, so obviously today we're talking about the Selena series. So we're yes. dying to know what are your thoughts? Honestly, like tell us the tea. Oh my goodness. How long is this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> However long you know, want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a lot of mixed feelings I have about this show. You know, I, I don't I think to just kind of dismiss it as either really good or really bad is really, you know, I think not giving it the best type of attention that it can be, right? I don't want to take in a reductionist approach and be like, this is crap. I turned it off after three episodes, or this is so great because it's not. You know, I'm a critical cultural professor and like I, I teach my students, we can celebrate things that uh, media does well while also critiquing them on what can they do better. And I think the Selena show is one of those great examples of things that are really great in some aspects, but really need a lot of help in other aspects. So do you want me to talk about the good things first and then we can kind of go Let's to like about the what good things my, first. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I was born in 1981. And so I was born in uh, Texas. I grew up in San Antonio for the first better part of my life. And then I moved to a small rural area in West Texas. But I grew up listening to Selena. So I know Selena like the Netflix series is portraying her. I fell in love with her. I identified with her in the 80s with the short hair and the crazy flashy costumes and, um, you know, that is what I identified with. So when I see this show, it's nostalgic for me. And I think for a lot of individuals from Texas and other places who really got to know Selena at that age, it's nostalgic for them too. 
I saw the Texas license plates. I'm like, oh my God, my grandpa used to have a license plate like that on their car. Um, there's a scene where they're like outside eating in the front yard. I don't know why they're in the front yard, but they're in the front yard. Like uh, Abe, Abe, Abraham is cooking at the, or grilling and Suzette has a wine cooler and she picks it up and I'm like, oh my God, I have not seen anybody drinking a wine cooler since like my tias and my family like back in the 80s and early 90s. So there was a lot of nostalgic moments for me. There's also a lot of really sincere and endearing moments like when Suzette encounters that young woman in Mexico and she gives her the drumsticks and there's that kind of moment. Um, and there's also, I think, a lot of story there that we didn't see in the movie or didn't read about in the books, right? So there is a lot of behind the scene, I think, nods to what happened in Selena's life that we didn't get in other aspects. So I think there's great moments here and there. I think what's missing is this really kind of arc, this narrative story that takes people from point A to point B. And I think there's also um, a lot of time lapses that don't make sense for people who don't know Selena. Well, that's getting into that clip, what needs to be better. Another thing I think that's really great is that you're looking at Tejano music. And when we think about Latinx media in general, we think about music and culture, we think about like Maluma, Bad Bunny, Jennifer Lopez, which are all great and amazing and I love them. But we often don't think about like that kind of Latinx culture that is already here embedded. I mean, and that's what Selena is. Selena is an American. She was born in the United States. That culture that's Tejano is the United States. It's not Mexico, which is why there's a lot of tension, I think, that you see between her trying to break into Spanish music in Mexico and then her trying to break into mainstream English music. There's a lot of tension because she's not really situated here or there. And so I think this is a great you know, representation of people who are at that nexus of Tejano music. So it showcases that there's all different ways to be Latinx. And Selena shows us that there is a way to be Latinx without knowing Spanish perfectly, without having to kind of perform to the status quo. And I think that's a great thing. It's a story about, you know, um, a Mexican-American family in the United States as the kind of, you know, the Cinderella story as they rise to fame. Exactly. And to kind of piggyback off your point, I really do feel like I... I was born right after she died, a couple months after she passed. So I only know Selena through the JLo movie and through like my own research and kind of like listening to, kind of discovering her on my own, not through the media. And so I didn't really know a lot of the early Selena years. So that's what I appreciate about this Netflix show that I'm like, oh, okay, like I'm seeing her as a young child and like kind of like the struggles of her family. Cause I mean, I knew her family struggled and I, I knew the top line of it. So just kind of to see like, they, I mean, how true is it? We don't really know, but the fact that like they were using pineapple or like the fruit cans for light and just like the depths that they would go to like make this dream come true, it was really nice. And it really does help paint that like rags to riches. Like they really came from like generally nothing and they worked so hard. And that's something that I think resonates with a lot of people, not even just Latin yeah. people, but just everyone that it's like, she is the embodiment of the American dream that she came from nothing. She's a second generation, Mexican, but born in America, and she made this huge thing. She became an icon. Um, so I appreciate that from the show. That's probably yeah, the one and I think I it also kind of show. highlights that she came up to this this fame, right? Not mm -hmm. by herself, but with the help mm -hmm. of her family. Um, yeah. Albeit, you know, Abraham's character, I think, is a little bit brash. Um, and I've met him in real life. I've interviewed him in real life, and I can tell you that. Abraham um but you know I think it's great that it highlights the others in the store in the story it's yeah. Selena's story I think mm -hmm. though there's a little bit too much neglect of Selena herself Selena in this herself. series mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay so let's go to the bad things <laughs> <laughs> well before, I, I just want to say one more good thing okay as I'm teaching this class, you know, we have to create different modules and I pick different pictures to represent each module. And one of them I picked to represent one of the modules was the cover of Selena's Ven Conmigo, which is her kind of sideways with her really, really, really short hair. And everyone's like, why did you pick that picture? I'm like, that's my favorite Selena. Like, that's my favorite album. That's the album that I connected with and started to love her. Everything else she did was great as well. But that's what I remember about her. That's the Selena I love, the short hair Selena with that album. And to see them showcase that as kind of like, the part of Netflix was meant really, really a lot to me. Plus the songs that I really connected with too that she covered are in there as well too. So I think that that's good. Um, so the bad parts, wow. Okay, so there's so many to start with. <laughs> the first, I think, the first that I think is very evident for people who are not Selena fans when you start watching the Netflix series is that when you get from episode one to episode two, so much stuff happens that you don't know where the hell you're at. And so I had other friends and family and, and colleagues, right, texting me and they're like, what just happened? Can you fill in the gaps for me? I've, I've known Selena's life 
for as long as I remember because I was there, you know, growing up with her. I remember the movie. And so for me, those gaps are filled in in my head. And so I didn't realize just how much that time gap happens from like the first movie where all of a sudden Selena's like singing out there, all chasing fireflies and like, you're going to sing Spanish. We don't see why she wants to sing in English. We don't see what makes her want. It looks like the father is telling her she has to sing and that's the only choice she has. We don't see that kind of passion from Selena wanting to be a singer. We also see them all of a sudden singing at a restaurant. Where did the restaurant come from? It's called Papa Gallo's. Why did it go bankrupt? That's left out of the story. And then the story, I think episode one, I don't know if it's episode one or two, ends with the family moving to Corpus Christi to stay with Abraham's brother. And they're all like up on mouse together in one room sleeping together. And then the next episode, they have their own house. And then like 10 minutes in, they're buying three houses. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. What the hell just happened? But during all this, they're still dumpster diving and getting these peach cans and I'm just like there's a lot of stuff missing here so I don't know if they just needed a couple more episodes in those first three if they needed more time for this because it, it's relatively short it's nine episodes the whole yeah. series and I don't know what's missing or I know what's missing I don't know how they could have done that better but there's a lot of time jumps with a lot of gaps that really just don't get filled in for people who don't know Selena you're kind of left to wonder yeah. why and how did this happen Mm -hmm. that's my biggest you. complaint <laughs> what are do you have any other complaints about oh, it yeah, I, I know i've a, heard other yeah, i have a whole list right here oh you have a whole um, list <laughs> yes i love it i knew you'd come with a list <laughs> i do have a list right because you know and, and this has been pointed out a whole bunch of times on on uh facebook too and, and, and instagram and snapchat every social media platform right is the quality of the way in which this film was shot. And I know that there's a lot of people defending it saying, well, we wanted to really highlight, you know, them being at a very, you know, uh, lower socioeconomic status. They go to Mexico. I was like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that your camera doesn't have to be from 1962 either. Like that means that Netflix, you invested a lot of money into this. Like you should have shot it very well. You should have gotten the storyline right. You should have known how to tell this story correctly. Um, they also open like with her going to the Tejano Music Awards and they show San Antonio, which I grew up in. And the skyline shows, I think it's like the Grand Hyatt Hotel that wasn't built till 2008. And that's the shot they keep coming back to. And I'm like, come on, Netflix. Like, oh, get the an wigs. Old shot. can we just talk about the wigs? Can we talk about the wigs really quick? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's something I noticed. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say about it that hasn't mm -hmm. already been said. Like, would y'all wear wigs like that? No. I know. I, I was wondering that because I'm like, this is Netflix money. Yeah. <laughs> like, why is it not? I was, I was, I definitely noticed the wigs. I didn't it, notice the camera as much, but I noticed the it wigs. It feels like a, I don't want to say tacky production because that's negative connotation, but it does feel like the production value. It's like they spent so much money. And also Netflix, when they announced this like two years ago, they announced this a while ago. Everyone was hyped. Netflix knew this was like their tent pole of December. So they knew this was like going to be their big thing. And I'm like, okay, I'm kind of, I kind of am disappointed. Like it feels corny to me. It does. And I'm like, I don't want this to feel corny because this story isn't corny. And also like this story has been told before, which is one of the issues I have with it. It's just like, I feel like her dad is always trying to get that coin. <laughs> and so part of me is just like, Selena is missing from the show. She's like the supporting actress, not even the main star. The show is named after her. The quality of the show feels corny. I'm learning more about her brother and her dad. And actually when I started catching that it was just her dad and almost, I like, I was like, oh, this is about Abraham and AB. And then I started catching like Abraham is in almost every single scene and he has like a big speech or like a, a fit or something in almost every single scene. And I'm like, that that's not what I signed up for. Like, <laughs> <laughs> What is this atrocity? No, I think you're completely right. I think, you know, going back to Netflix, hyping it up, I think, you know, it's 25 years later from her death, right? So there's like this 25th anniversary thing happening. Um, the class was launching the same, the spring of her 25th anniversary. They had this huge concert in San Antonio scheduled for the Alamo Dome for her 25th anniversary um, with artists that really didn't do a lot with Selena, which is a whole thing on its own. They had, you know, this whole Mac cosmetic relaunch again with her. So it was like this big, like 25 years later, we're still celebrating Selena. And for me, all I can think about is, you know, the commercialization of Selena's image. And so for me, you know, making the class was not about making money. I don't make any money, right? The students aren't making any money. It's generally, why is she being celebrated 
continuously and why is she so relevant 25 years later? And that's the focus of the classes. Where, what are we missing in Latinx representation that we're still holding on to Selena? What does she symbolize? How can she help us understand the landscape of Latinx media and representation, but also help us, I think, see the relationship between the socio-political atmosphere and then what's happening in media, right? Because we see a lot of representation. We can take Netflix, right? And they have like Casa de las Flores, Elite, One Day at a Time, now the Selena series. Yet Mexicans are still being villainized, right? In the streets and in politics, right? This whole build the wall rhetoric with Trump and his ridiculous stuff. So we still see kind of like, you know, this, this weird kind of thing where representation might be increasing a little bit on television and media, but in the physical world, right? There's still kids in cages, women's getting forced hysterectomies that are migrants. We still have all of these crazy things happening in the real world. So there's that disconnect and that's what the class was really gonna focus on, right? It, well, it did focus on because we had the class, but a whole section of the class also focuses on this commercialization of Selena, right? Target using her image to keep selling shirts. Walmart uses it. The Mac line, all of this money that keeps keeps coming in. And you know, even with this Netflix series, with the hype behind it, there was a lot of social media hype. And I was like, oh my god, okay, I'm getting excited. the The Christian Serrato that they showed in the previews is not the Christian Serrato that I saw in the series. Um, she had the red lipstick, like you beautiful women are wearing right now, right? Your red lipstick, the hoop earrings, and she was like walking to the stage. Where was she in the show? Where was that image in the show? Because I didn't see it. And I get it, right? You're looking at the 80s first. I appreciate that they showed the 80s. I appreciate the short hair. I appreciate the, the, the cool, flashy costumes of the 80s. What I don't appreciate is the production value that they gave to it. Those wigs could have been way better. Those costumes could have been way better. Like, there was just so much detail that they neglected that it makes it seem like, here's Selena. We're going to put out there for our Latinx fans. And we're going to make money off of it. And her fans didn't disappoint. Her fans came and watched it. We all tuned yeah. in. It's trending on Netflix. It's number one. But once we started watching it, we're like, hold up, wait a minute. <laughs> Where's the Selena that we know, you know? And I think that's important as well. Definitely. And, and it it's, does seem frustrating. And it kind of goes back to what you said about money. Because it's like, did Netflix neglect with these details? Because they knew, of course, it's going to be in our top anyway. Like, of mm -hmm. course, people are going to watch it no matter what. So I feel like that's kind of a frustrating thing to see too. No, very frustrating. Yeah, it, it honestly does feel a lot like this was just a way for them to make money, maybe for the family. Because I know Suzette's an executive producer. I don't, I can't tell at the top of my head if it was like if AB and Abraham are executive producers, they could be. Um, but it's just like very interesting to me that like this was just another way to make money for them. And they knew people would watch it. And it's just like, it didn't teach me anything new. I wanted to learn something new. And yes, I learned something about her early life that I didn't know, mm -hmm. but I felt like, I feel like I didn't need it. Like I, I want to learn more and continue to learn more about Selena, but this isn't the show I needed to do that because it doesn't really add anything extra to, to what I didn't already know. Yeah, I, th I think for a lot of people, they felt that way. I think a lot of younger individuals who, didn't grow up when Selena was alive, but watched Jennifer Lopez's portrayal, right? Because even in my students in my class, we're always comparing Selena to Jennifer Lopez. And they remember Yolanda as Lupe Deveros. They remember Selena as Jennifer Lopez. So these comparisons between Christian, right, and Selena have Jennifer Lopez in the middle. So now you have three different things, right? Three different references that you're trying to get. And I think for the younger generation who saw, right, this movie that had good production, that had good actors and actresses, that had, you know, Gregory Nava directing it, right? It was, it was great. And now you have this production and you're just like, this is not what we expected. And I think, you know, there's, there's also some stuff happening, right? There's some stuff happening in terms of the money issues between that AB's having, that AB the third is having, right? The fact that who owns the rights to Selena's name and Selena's story because they're being sued again by some other person because somebody else says they have the rights to the story. And then also that Suzette, right, has most of the rights to, to the, the name of Selena, right? But before in the past, Abraham and AB had also rights to Selena's name. Where did they go? What happened there, right? Where did that go? And, and I'm sure it all revolves around money, right? And yeah. I'll, I'll also give you a little bit of an exclusive here that I haven't given the other interviews that I've done is the brother, AB, has reached out to me twice for me to give him money for the class. I know, I know. So he's, he, and, and it's not even him himself, it's people who represent him. And the emails that have come in are misspelled. At first I thought it was a joke because they're like misspelled. They're not even like, like 
I'll show them to you. Um, and they oh wanted money God. for the class because, and, and you know what, A.B. wrote the songs. He's a great songwriter. I'm not going to yeah. take that away from him. And I think he deserves some time in the show because he was yeah. a great songwriter. If it wasn't for his song, Selena wouldn't have been able to sing, right? The songs that she no, sang. Yeah. Um, but to ask me for money, the university, I'm like, we're not making money. You know, you should be really honored that we have a class dedicated to your sister. And so, you know, they've contacted me twice. We've just let, you know, the SDSU lawyers um, talk to them. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a class that's teaching, right? Not, we're not showing people how to play her music. We're not making money. We're not charging people to, you know, uh, watch the Selena movie or listen to the music. We're not even teaching the music. And so I think, you know, there is this issue of money that keeps being central to everything that the Quintanillas do. And anyone that you talk to and interact that has anything to do with the Quintanillas goes back to that, right? You see a lot of comments on social media that are like, oh, they're money hungry and they're using Selena's name and commercialization. And I get that Selena now has become a cultural commodity, right? She belongs to all of us. Yes, she's yeah. your daughter. Yes, she's your sister. And when people ask Suzette, you know, do you like the, the, the representation in the show? And she's just like, yes, I love it. Well, she's the executive producer. Of course, she's going to say she gonna loves it. it. But on top of that, I think Suzette and them, what they did was try to craft a story of like the behind the scenes that they saw of Selena on the bus and in person. And that I think is great. I think there's that intimacy that we see, right? That relationship between Selena and Suzette is so beautiful, right? In these moments mm -hmm. that we see it. I think for the fans, the Selena we know is the Selena that's on stage, the Selena that's singing, that's kind of doing her little hand movements and performing, laughing, doing interviews. Why was she so endearing, right? Um, that's missing from, from the Netflix show. Christian Serratos is an awesome actress. I think she was great to play Selena. Did she not deliver on stage during the performances? I think that's true. I think they padded her with butt padding. That just is very unfortunate. If you go back and watch the show again, look for the butt pads. Um, but she doesn't <laughs> have that onstage charisma and, and movement that Selena had. And I think that's what the fans are missing too because we don't know the behind the scenes Selena. We know the in front of the camera Selena. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were looking for. I think it's great that we have that intimate portrait of, you know, that Suzette gave us from behind the scenes, that Abraham gave us from behind the scenes. But I feel like there's this kind of tension between what the fans expected and what the fans got. Uh, but there's two different Selenas, right? There's the Selena that her family knows, it's very intimate and dear, and there's a Selena that the public knows. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, all of that, right, has that tension, and then there's like money signs <laughs> all yeah. over. And it's very hard for us to kind of disentangle all of that stuff when it's just presented to us as this, you know, low budget Netflix show that's there for money with, mm -hmm horrible wigs yeah i still can't get over the wigs <laughs> and now the i know yeah they were they were not the greatest well we kind of touched on this a little bit but i mean why now why 25 years later why on this platform why do you think that is well money right that's <laughs> that's one of the big things is the money but i think also because we need representation we don't have representation to the extent that we need it we have all these various facets and i think it also comes down to the point that we're trying to say the latinx community is this one monolithic group like when we say latinx that encompasses so many people so many languages so many you know different regions of the world as well it's just like what happened with the election right they're like well we thought we had the latin vote well which one because you know in florida the cuban vote was the one that you were worried about in texas the mexican-american vote in california there's also like el salvadorians and you know all different mm -hmm. types of of other Lat latinx or latin populations here too so i think we're really looking for representation and for those that are mexican-american we don't have that where are we looking for that at you know we we are trying to find it it's it's reduced or kind of relegated to like univision and telemundo selena was like this crossover hit when i remember when i saw her movie on e i was like we made it we got a mexican american yeah. on e she's like the feature she's at 7 p.m prime time e movie of the week you know we made it we don't have that representation i think there's a lot of also young latinas who need that representation which mm -hmm. one of the biggest issues in this show is the misogyny right yeah. is that there's just i mean i was listening to another podcast the other day locutora radio and one of the women that's that's the host her name is i think mala munoz she called it a machista travesty and this whole show basically portrays selena as kind of this caricature that just giggles and laughs and has one-liners and she does whatever the men tell her to you know mm -hmm. 
this the scene also where like everyone has their own hotel room except for Selena. She has to sleep in the same hotel room as her mom and dad, right? They're like this chastity that they're trying to keep on her. This this kind of control, yeah. but that Selena then you know doesn't get the treatment that she deserves. Like where was her agency? Where was her involvement in the music in her career? We don't see that come through in this Netflix movie either. And I feel like it's there somewhere. I feel like there's a lot of other representation that because of the storytelling and the time jumping in the wigs, we don't get <laughs> to see that part. But I think, you know, now 25 years later, we need representation for black and brown folks. We need representation for brown women, Mexican American women. And, you know, this show was, was there, right, to deliver it. And I think people gravitated to it because here is a Mexican American woman that we're seeing at the top of her game, even if it is 25 years after her death. And then we have these, you know, machista interactions on here. We have the horrible wigs. We have the butt pads. I don't know what message that gives to people who are not Selena fans, who don't know who she is, and this is their first introduction to her. Yeah. So what does Selena's legacy mean to you as a Latino? Well, her legacy is just that, that I can do whatever the heck I want to do, that I can be whatever I want to be. I mean, growing up as a queer brown boy in Texas, I mean, it was already rough enough, right? And then not being able to kind of speak Spanish completely, you know, fluently. I was a pocho. I say words that aren't very correct. So for me, you know, she helped me understand my identity. She helped me understand that it was okay. There's not one real way to be a Latino, right? You can be all these different things. She was also that rags to riches story, you know, that I grew up in poverty. I, I you know, we used to call it the projects, but it was, you know, um, HUD, which was, I think, you know, housing, um, lower housing, you know, subsidies and, and help for, for people that are lower economic uh, status. And I, you know, I grew up in, in very poor um, rural West Texas. And so for me, seeing somebody come from that and being able to succeed, not just like a Cinderella, not just like, you know, people who didn't match my my identity, seeing someone like Selena, who was Mexican American, who came from this, who was Tejana, who was a pocho, rise to that. For me, that's the legacy. And to see that she can still endure all these years. And regardless what the Netflix movie is, regardless what her family does and how many shirts Hot Topic sells, for me, there's always that connection. You know, we have the the Spotify, what, what do they do with Spotify and Apple at the end of the year? They show you like your top artists. Oh, the rap? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Selena for me was still number three. I mean, Maluma and Bad Bunny were up there, but Selena was number three. And so for me, it's like, I'm not honoring her by buying shirts from Hop Topic. I'm listening to her music. I'm still connecting with that. And it connects with me. And, and the class that I created for her, right, is about showing other students, right, what representation means, using Selena as that cultural anchor. And so for me, that's what her legacy means, is the opportunity for young brown people, whether they're women, men, transgender, whether they're queer, straight, bi, in between, no matter what they are, they can see themselves in this individual and see, wow, I, I can be not just successful, but I can be kind and I can give back. And I think that's what Selena was. She was genuine. She was endearing. And we don't really see a lot of that um, now. <laughs> and y'all didn't even tell me what you thought of the Selena show. Like, this isn't just about me. Like, did y'all see the show? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Do you want to start? You want to go first? Oh, I, yeah, I can, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm like, who goes first? I can start. I mean, I feel like, because I, I was telling Emily, I haven't seen the full movie yet. And I, I wanted to watch it this week, but I didn't have time The Jennifer Lopez movie. So this was really, besides like hearing you guys both talk about Selena and hearing other friends talk about Selena and hearing her songs. This was really my first kind of exposure to her. And it made me want to learn more, I think. So, I mean, at least that's good if people maybe who are like me or younger too and hadn't really been too exposed to Selena, I feel like this is hopefully a good starting point. Yeah, and I do think that was part of the show too, like the the purpose of the show, I mean, besides the money, I think it was also to hopefully educate people that have never been, like, learned about Selena or don't really know much about her or, like, the younger generations, like, the 10-year-old, right, who are, like, who hear their parents maybe playing Selena, but they never actually went in the extra mile to Google her, so it's, like, an introduction to her. Um, I'm not a big, uh, I mean, I was bored. It took me a long time to get through the first episode because I feel like now everybody kind of just like watches on their screen like they watch then they have like a phone or something and then they're tweeting or they're doing other things and I was just yeah. like oh I missed 10 minutes of the show because I was bored mm -hmm. of the first episode and then I had to go back and watch it and then I was Alex and I were like oh let's talk about Selena and I was like okay I really have to pay attention <laughs> and <laughs> it was just like I felt like it wasn't as, and I think part of the reason is because I wasn't expecting it to be the Abraham and AB show. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, maybe if it was called Selena y los Dinos, right? That would give yeah. us an idea that it's about the family, right? And I think that AB and Abraham and Suzette each contributed and they have, they should, their story should be shared. It should be on there. But I think Netflix misled its, list, its viewers by saying just Selena and the teasers they put out were just Selena. And I think that when you watch the show, like Suzette, the person who plays Suzette steals the, the scene every time. I think she's an amazing yeah. actress. Mm -hmm. I think all of them are great actors and actresses in their own right. I think that, you know, it's just... We need more Selena um, in there and we need less machista kind of things. And, you know, granted, maybe that's exactly how it happened. Maybe Abraham was just that machista person, um, which I won't go into in this, in, this particular, <laughs> in this particular interview. But, you know, we're still seeing that representation, you know, just being recycled over and over again. The same, you know, women are supposed to be properties of their fathers and their husbands and do what they're told and stay quiet about it, look pretty, wear makeup, look at magazines, right? So we still see that. But anyway, it was great being on your show. Anytime you want to drop by the Selena class, we're having it again in spring of 2022. Okay, okay. yay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank Ew. you so much. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Oh my God, where, they can find me anywhere. Just Google <laughs> Google <laughs> Nate SDSU and you're going to find so, so many things um, <laughs> that are there. But you know, my Twitter handle or yeah, Twitter handle, right? Um, you can tweet me at, at Nate underscore SDSU and then on Instagram, Nate uh rod Woo! perfect yay, yay thank you so thank much thank you so much <sighs> all right alex so now we're gonna start this new thing right where we're gonna try okay. to talk a little bit about ourselves at the end of the show to kind of just let you know what's been happening with us we've talked about alex's foot it's recovering mm -hmm. nicely right mm -hmm. oh yes and i always love talking about myself so this is <laughs> this is great for me i will say that <laughs> um okay so this week i wanted to share uh a story that's something that happened to me so i made Ooh. really fire chicken wings really d delicious um but you know chickens are animals that have bones and mm -hmm. so on thursday i like had some leftover wings and i swallowed a chicken bone <laughs> so how did this happen like how, how did it go down oh my god through my esophagus <laughs> no <laughs> Like, how did you, okay, so you were eating the chicken wing. Did you not know the bone was there? Like, how to, like, describe okay. the, I'm getting too excited. Describe the scene. <laughs> okay, so I was eating, I was kind of, like, rushing because I didn't have a lot of time. I had a lot of stuff to do, so I was like, okay, just eating this chicken wing. And then, like, you know how when you're eating it, like, you eat with your hands, and you kind of, like, try to take the meat off and then just, like, you know, peel off the bone? And so right. I got this, like, piece of meat, and I didn't think there was a bone in it, obviously. So then I just ate it, and then I was, like, I, sw I don't, maybe I didn't chew enough to, like, see that there was still a bone and it wasn't a big bone either it was like like a, like a small little bone and then yeah. I literally like swallowed it and I was like that was a bone okay <laughs> oh my god that is awful and like I could feel it like going down my throat and honestly like I think it's still in there like <laughs> oh my god I'm gonna cry so the rest of the day <laughs> the rest of the day I was just like oh my god it's a lot of chicken but like what if I die like what if do I need the Heimlich like what <laughs> and I just like felt it like genuinely like it felt like it was stuck here for like a while and then but towards the end of the day I was like okay I think it I think it's like went a little down I think now it's made its way to my stomach if it hasn't come oh. out already <laughs> oh my god that is so awful and like no, just like sucked. I've I I've been so disgusted by like chicken and like like poultry like I don't like eating bird anymore so like just the thought of like okay. a chicken bone in your throat because like I like I will I admit like my anxiety medication and my birth control I dry swallow <laughs> it so sometimes I'll still feel the pill like yeah. in my throat so like I know the feeling but not as a chicken bone like that is awful and I honestly for a while I didn't eat any anything that was I only ate fish I was basically pescatarian mm -hmm. for like three months like dead right. serious and so I just started again like kind of after Thanksgiving eating like chicken and turkey and stuff again mm -hmm. and I'm like of course I fucking swallow a chicken bone I can't feel it anymore <coughs> I don't think it's gone and that's my that's could, my update I could cry if I think about it too much it's <laughs> an awful awful update well I mean on a lighter note what's your good news of the week 
Okay, um, my best friend's birthday <laughs> just passed and we had a COVID free, we were like all socially distant, but we watched a movie. She has a projector. And so we went to her backyard and we like put flowers on the floor and like a little quilt and stuff and like um, pillows. And we watched Moulin Rouge, which is her favorite movie in the backyard. And we got um, John and Vinny's, which is like this really good Mexican, uh, oh. uh, not Mexican, uh, Italian place in LA. And uh-huh. it was fucking amazing oh, oh it was so gosh. good and we got her this like vegan um cake cheesecake that was like the mm-hmm. best one of the best cakes I've ever had in my life it was so good and so it was oh, just like a really nice awesome. time we were safe and then we celebrated her birthday and it was great oh that's so awesome I love that how my, about was your best good news of the week <laughs> my good news of the week this was honestly like kind of a not great week for me but you know I'm having revelations and I know we want to do episodes uh, in the new year talking about kind of career stuff and just not just about us career stuff, but have like career mm-hmm. coaches and stuff to come in. Cause obviously this is a trying time for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like I'm just having revelations and kind of like realizing more what I want to do. And I'm like, thank you all for listening, for listening to us. Cause this is what I want to do. Stuff Yay. like this. So, <laughs> so that's well, good. we have. We have our favorite good news of the week story this week. Since it's a longer episode, we'll just share one. But Jack said, finish my reporter reel. I've wanted to have it done for weeks and finally did it. Yay! And I can't wait till you get it your reporter job. That's going to be Yes. <laughs> it's exciting. Well, thank you all. This has been another great episode. Yes, and don't forget to follow us along on social, on Instagram. We are what a week show underscore. Mm-hmm. On Twitter, we are what a week show. Oh, oh wait, flip. <laughs> Fuck, how do I? <laughs> it's down here. It's a day. The it's correct day. socials are on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> on YouTube. Because yeah, I usually say the YouTube. Okay, on YouTube, we're what a week <laughs> with Alex and Emily. <laughs> yes. And yeah, uh, interact with us, like our stuff, subscribe, give a review, (laughs) do what you need to do. (laughs) We're losing it. Okay, bye. We're going to see you next week. Bye, guys. See you next week.